Yeah, for some reason the share screen is greyed out. Try that again now. Try that again now, John. No, it's still greyed out. It's definitely showing that you should be able to do it at this end. Uh, sorry, try that one. That's oh, looking good, looking good. Okay then, I'll just um, say a few more words about myself. Um, I first started in radio when I was 10 years old in 1959. My mother bought me a Christmas present, which was a Transtronic electronics kit, which allowed me to build um, crystal sets and uh, radios with amplifiers and a very low powered transmitter. Um, not quite legal because it worked in the medium wave band, but it was only about 20 milliwatts DC input. Uh, and the antenna with that kit was um, a funny piece of uh, ribbon which um, failed after a while. Uh, so I bought some so-called antenna wire from a TV repair shop and started experimenting with antennas at 10 years old and have been doing so ever since. So um, today's talk is uh, omnidirectional antennas and I shall start off with um, HF antennas. So um, what is an antenna? In radio terms, it's a device which radiates RF energy into space. Um, So how does it do that? Simultaneously it generates oscillating electric, electronic and magnetic fields which are orthogonal, i.e. at right angles to each other. And what do we mean by omnidirectional? Well an omnidirectional antenna is one that radiates or receives from every direction in the horizontal plane and probably the simplest type is the vertical antenna working against ground such as the one in the diagram. Um, pretty basic. Uh, in its simplest form, you would make an earth connection, you put an earth spike in the ground, feed it with, um, usually with coax, and uh, the antenna height is often a quarter wave, but it doesn't have to be. Right. The vertical antenna gives a vertically polarized omnidirectional radiation pattern and is probably the only practical omni HF antenna for the average amateur. Its radiation pattern is shaped like a donut. I'm sure you've all seen those before. Um, it's an advantage over horizontal wire antennas in that it requires only a small footprint if the ground is conductive, i.e. you don't need to use wire or mesh radials. If you're on a small property and the ground's poor, um, you would have to use shortened radials or go into next door's garden. Um, so it, it can be a bit of a compromise. VHF you could also use a vertical antenna as an omni, and a lot of people do, especially for 2 metres and 77 on FM. A typical antenna would be a collinear or white stick, sometimes with elevated radials. These are commercially available. Uh, you can make your own. It's possible to make things like J-poles with ribbon cable and so on. However, most VHF DXs use SSB and CW and horizontally polarized. Um, <clears throat> and it's usually a, a Yagi Yuda type beam. Uh, not always, but that's, 
the most common sort of antenna that DX has used. Um, the reason we tend to use FM on, um, sorry, vertical polarization on FM and horizontal on SSB is a little bit obscure. I think for FM, it's the fact that stations are often using handhelds like this one and it has a, a rubber duck uh, as ver and it's normally held in that position with the antenna vertical so the corresponding uh, receive antenna at the other end needs to be the same polarization otherwise you get significant losses if you're actually cross polarized then the the loss is about 30 db so why the DX has used um, horizontal polarization. Well, there is some scientific basis for this in that uh, when you radiate a signal horizontally polarized, you get a better reflection from uh, dielectric mediums like seawater or tropospheric ducts. And <clears throat> the reason for this is that if you, if you have a, a mixed polarized signal, um, as it approaches the surface, a water surface, say, the vertical polarized part gets refracted into the surface and disappears underwater. The horizontal part gets reflected and goes back into space. So the same thing happens with the duct, but you get multiple reflections and the horizontal polarized wave stays inside the duct, whereas the vertically polarized wave can leak out of it. Now, uh, this effect works best at an angle of 37 and a half degrees, which is known as the Brewster angle. I shan't go into that in any more detail, but you, if you want to look it up in a physics textbook or uh, on the web, you can do. Um, so that's part of the reason why um, SSB uses horizontal polarization. So why did I get interested in omni antennas? Well, the first one I made was for four meters as a contest um, station. We didn't actually have an antenna. Um, the contest management group in our club changed and various people weren't able to supply equipment and so on. So I had to build an antenna. But we didn't have a spare rotator and this would have also complicated setting up so it had to be an omni uh, but being four meters and in those days vhf field day you had an eight hour session on cw and a eight hour session on uh, ssb with a break in between on four meters i think it was that way around it could have been ssb first and then cw i can't remember 20 odd years ago now. So it needed to be horizontally polarized. Now, one of the choices, sorry, one of the results of this is that everyone in range, i.e. less than the limit of propagation, would hear us all the time and keep clear our frequency. It also meant we would hear anyone who beamed in our direction irrespective of where they were. So it, was, it seemed like a good idea and it worked. Um, seem to have lost a slide. Carry on. So I made a thing called a double turnstile and it also turned out that on four meters the game was better than the average four meter beam that most people put up in those days. Uh, a four meter beam with four or five elements is quite a big beast. It's over 10 foot long, possibly 12 foot long. It's got a substantial boom and you need a fairly decent rotator to turn it. Not having a rotator means that the operator can't fiddle about with it and get already readable signals up in strength. Most contest replies in those days are 5-9. It 
irrespective of whether it was nine or not. The important thing is the five. If they're fully readable, then why bother trying to increase their signal strength? It just, just wastes time. And uh, although VHF contests aren't particularly hectic compared with HF, you don't really want to spend more time than necessary in working a station. The other thing with these antennas is the local noise from the ground is reduced. You'll see that later when I'll show you the, uh, the antenna patterns. But the disadvantage is that they pick up QRN and QRM from every direction, which you can't know. There aren't any nulls in the proper omnidirectional antenna. Right, so I mentioned collinear antennas before. This one, um, looking at the dimension, I think it was for 20 meters, this one. It was a bit of an odd one. It, the reason I chose this one, I've just grabbed it off the net earlier on. Um, this section at the top is what I call an SEQ antenna. Um, It's a collinear fed dipole, but rather than multiple elements, I decided I could feed this through the coax and use part of the outer of the coax as a, the radiating element. Um, this has got several advantages. It's, it's the shortest possible feed that I could come up with. And uh, it also meant you didn't have the problem with feeding a dipole at the centre and uh, having problems with RF coming back down the outside of the coax, which most people um, deal with by fitting a ballon at that point. Um, I'm not convinced that ballons actually do what they say they do. I think most most times when people fit balance, all they're actually doing is fitting an impedance matching device or transformer. Anyway, at the time when I came up with this idea, I thought it was something completely new because I hadn't been used on HF. I'd seen it used on VHF, but subsequently I found out later that it was dates back to 1948. And as luck would have it, at the time I published it in Sprat, someone else came up with the same idea but implemented it slightly differently and a bit fiddly as he um, actually probed into the coax and connected a variable capacitor to the centre conductor and I didn't like the idea of that at all uh, and someone else came up with uh, a guy in the states published something in QST which looked very similar to my antenna but um, what he use was traps to make it multi-band. Now, sorry this is a bit uh, faint, but if you, if you want, if you're interested in these antennas, um, it's the information's on my website, which was on the previous page. I'll just go back to previous. That's my website. And if you go there and click on the antennas button, you'll find your way to this design of antenna. And I've used these from uh, 80 metres up to um, 6 metres. So this is the, basically the antenna. I was fed in at this end. Ignore this transformer. I found that I didn't actually need it in the end. And uh, I did try it. And I also put some ferrite sleeves on and they weren't necessary either. I'll explain why in a moment. So you feed power in through there, it goes round and round the coax, but the RF doesn't know that it's following a coiled up piece of coax, it just thinks it's coax. So it flows up to this point where the inner conductor is connected to the outer of another piece of coax. Now, this other piece of coax, in fact, can just be a piece of ordinary wire. And in the portable antennas that are made, I just use a piece of wire. For that that's about a quarter wave long this joint here needs to be mechanically reinforced and i've used things like um, hot melt glue and um, uh, self amalgamating tape 
because the RF is flowing on the outside of the inner conductor and the inside of the outer conductor, when it gets to the end here, it's got nowhere to go, but flows back down the outside of the outer conductor until it reaches this thing, which originally I'd envisaged as a choke. Um, but fiddling around with it experimentally to improve the match and what have you, I quickly realized that it's not just a choke, it's actually a tune trap. Uh, and it works as a tune trap by the inter-turn capacitance. And I, I came up with this magic number purely experimentally of um, seven turns uh, with a diameter of about six inches for a, a 20 meter dipole. And it turns out that that coil is about a quarter wavelength long. So the total length of the antenna up to this point uh, is um, three quarters of a wavelength and then the coax run to the rig can be as short as you like and I've, I've used as little as um, two feet or 60 centimeters for that. Now it's just a dipole and as it is there it will um, work just like any other wide dipole. But if you want it to work as an omnidirectional antenna, you can hang it vertically. And uh, I'll explain a bit more about that later. Now then, an omnidirectional beam. So how can it be a beam if it's omnidirectional? So as all the previous antennas except the VHF collinears have little or no gain over a dipole. The following antennas turnstiles of gain because they have a narrow vertical beam width so it, it's beaming all over the countryside in the horizontal plane but it's not beaming upwards or downwards and this is a picture of a double turnstile on the back of my house that is actually the original four meter one that i built um, this bit in the foreground is actually um, well, there's several areas actually. There's uh, uh, when I took this photograph, I had stuff up to 77, two meters, and 23 seven. Uh, so ignore that. This is the double turn style antenna, and it consists of four dipoles crossed. And it's got a substantial amount of gain, about eight dBi in all directions in the horizontal plane. So it's ideal for DX working. The radiation pattern isn't quite as flat as a pancake, but slightly dish like a dinner plate, if you can imagine that. And this has some advantages. So the main lobe is pointing slightly above the horizon, which helps with tropospheric propagation, also cuts down and receive noise from the ground. So how does it work? Well, it's all down to phasing and this is a typical phase array it's not an omnidirectional antenna but i've just put this up as an example of how phasing works um, basically the the phase shift is done by different length elements and the way the gamma match is wired up and also by adjusting this trimmer don't like this design of antenna because i don't like messy little trimmers um, and it, <clears throat> at QRP levels, it's okay, but even if you're getting up to 10 watts, um, depending on what you use for the trimmer there, it could fail. So, but basically, due to phasing, this propagates RF from right to left in that direction. So, that gives you the idea of what phasing does. Uh, in the turnstile, the phasing is arranged so that it, um, it actually produces circular, circular polarisation going straight up in the air. But the effect of the image in the ground is to produce a, a totally different pattern. Um, right, some antennas that I hear on the air. There's no such thing as a non-resonant antenna. 
people who claim to have one are just using an antenna that isn't resonant on the frequency they've chosen to operate on and they end up using ATUs which I do use um, I prefer not to use them especially at QRP because they're lossy the other antenna myth is twin feeder is inherently less lossy than coaxial cable it's just not true it depends on their dimensions and constructions and in fact in the TV broadcast uh, business they use uh, huge pieces of coax huge diameter coax which have a vacuum of them to reduce the losses even further and <clears throat> I also know somebody once who made some twin feeder up out of uh, beryllium copper wire and wondered where all his RF went and it was very thin wire and uh, very very high resistance <clears throat> so um, but that's another story. Right, some practical antennas. Right, for a simple antenna, you can't beat a dipole, but you can improve its mechanical and electrical design from the standard pattern. For example, the collinear fed dipole, aka resonant feed dipole, which I described earlier, uh, it's mistakenly believed to be end fed. And I thought I'd scrub that here's one, I've already shown you that. So, so it can be hung vertically to give an omnidirectional pattern. They use less materials and they're therefore lighter and have less losses, as this represents the shortest possible feeder, especially when used as a slope or vertical, either from a high building or suspended from a balloon. And yes, I've tried them all. Uh, the other thing I've done with them, I've operated when I was in Victoria, Australia, I used uh, the same antenna wherever I went, but the first place I was staying was a hotel. And fortunately I was on the second or third floor and uh, I managed to dangle the antenna almost vertically out of the uh, window of the uh, room we were in down to um, a palisade fence that was just happened to be screening off some dustbins and that worked very well so I was feeding from the top end of it um, with the, the wire going down towards ground but not connected to ground. Um, the other thing about these antennas you don't need an ATU because that coil which I described as a tune trap you can actually adjust it um, simply by um, taking a part turn off one and say a quarter of a turn and adding it on the other to maintain the same frequency that shifts the feed point and also the feed point impedance uh, or you can add a turn on or part of a turn to alter the tuning of the, of the trap and it, Usually it only takes me about five minutes to fiddle around with it to get the SWR down and you can get it down to one to one but most of the time I'm happy with anything less than about 1.4, 1.3 one to one. And again you can look on my website for the latest design of these antennas. Right. I'll just briefly mention travelling wave antennas. Um, basically, they're a piece of wire with a load at the far end, and a load of power left that was not radiated by the wire. These will work on practically any frequency, although their efficiency is a bit on the low side. And I have used one in the hotel situation, situation using a piece of coax with a dummy load on the end, but you reverse the connections at the transmitter and you, you connect the outer to uh, the inner of the SO239 and ground the inner. Uh, all right, going back to verticals, one way of improving a vertical rather than driving it against ground, particularly if you, you live in an area with very dry sandy soil, is to add some radials. Um, or you can actually elevate the whole antenna like this one and have sloping radials. Now, 
Uh, there was some discussion in Callum's uh, webinar this morning about how many radials you need. And in fact, the minimum number of radials that you need is just two. And they should be 180 degrees apart. So it's like an inverted T. And the reason for that is the um, horizontal component that the antenna is trying to radiate is cancelled out um, because the the, the uh, current flowing along these radials is in opposite directions and you're just left with the vertical uh, polarised component. Um, some RCA engineers found this out many years ago in the 1930s I believe um, but they put four radials on because the two radials didn't look right. That's the story anyway. All right, back to turnstile antennas. This is a typical turnstile arrangement. It looks a bit odd to me because the, the feed um, is coming from above. Normally it would come from below. I think it's been drawn like that because uh, for clarity reasons. The U-shaped piece is the phasing line which changes the phase between the, uh, the two dipole elements, between dipole one and dipole two. When you turn this into a double turn style, you can use the same arrangement, and, uh, but you need to make sure that dipole two, for instance, that the uh, left hand element as I'm looking at is the same connection, i.e. the inner connection as the ones above it. And the same for all the other elements. Uh, so the elements above this need to be in the same phase as these ones. Um, with a double turn style antenna they're half a wavelength apart, but you need to feed them with a coax between them that keeps them in phase. So that needs to be one wavelength long uh, taking into account the um, velocity factor of the, the cable and it works out that if you use solid dielectric um, it's, it comes out as two thirds of a wavelength which gives you just enough to uh, put inside the supporting pole with uh, enough left over to wrap around and connect to the dipoles. Right, the, um, the double turnstile has got more gain than a single turnstile like the one in the previous diagram. And this is especially true when it's mounted just above ground. I've tried simulations using um, L neck and Easy neck uh, of the antenna at different heights. Um, when I first built this antenna and I analysed it using L neck, I did it as a free space antenna and I was quite disappointed by the results. Then I thought, well, it's actually going to go over real ground. And I put the real ground in and it made a completely different uh, radiation pattern and the gain came up. So <clears throat> they rely on ground gain and uh, usually you get about 8 dBi of gain with them, although um, Dave G1ORG has built one and he claims he's measured 9 dB of gain uh, with his, his, I think it's a 4 metre one he did the measurements on. He, <clears throat> I've also made these for 6 metres and 2 metres and I've had, um, I've made a quad turn cell which is two of these double turn cells stacked one above the other for 77. Right, the radiation pattern. I'm only showing the um, the cross section that you get um, for the radiation pattern. Imagine those those other lobes. They they look like a shallow dinner plate, and the next one looks a bit like a soup bowl, and the, the one in the middle looks like a um, a wine glass in 3D. Uh, if you do the uh, azimuth plot of these you end up with what's almost a perfect circle uh, there's about half a db difference between 
parts of the circle and other parts is actually four four lobes if you like which are half a db stronger so it's a pretty good omni this um lobe here is the one that i'm mainly interested in for dx working is practically all horizontally polarized these other lobes um, you've got elliptical polarization and this one is nearly circular now there's quite a bit of energy left in these lobes and it's probably wasted for dx working on on vhf but it does actually give you an antenna which is quite good for working satellites um, and <clears throat> having these lobes as circularly polarized is also a bonus for working satellites but um, going back to the omni the this angle here um, that determines the uh, that's determined by the height it's set above ground um, this one this is actually the lowest frequency one I've ever made which is 28.2 megahertz this one was um, I built that only ever used it twice because it's a um, bit of a beast to put up and the only place I've got to put it up at the time it overhung my neighbor's garden which I wasn't too happy about I don't suppose he was either um, <clears throat> I did put it up once as a portable antenna at the club the thing about this though it, it's got 8.6 dBi of gain and when you think about that that's um, that's like putting a linear amplifier on with some welly uh, with a QRP signal um, the first outing that <clears throat> I use this on um, I wasn't licensed uh, to work on HF with my GA call in those days so I invited two other hands round and they ran their 100 watt rig and I think the first station we worked was in Ethiopia, Ethiopia and that was some going um, on 10 meters and uh, we were a big signal with 100 watts going on it was, it was like having a kilowatt linear on the end right going back to turnstile radiation patterns this is for a single turnstile um, this this is quite an interesting antenna it's got less gain than the double turnstile as you'd expect about 3 db less gain so um, twice twice the number of elements uh, doubles the gain so increase in 3 db and um, that is the radiation pattern for this turnstile made with loops now I've not made one of these but my friend Bob who only lives 400 meters away built one of these um, it was designed by Chebik who's no longer with us um, it's actually octahedral it's a, so it's a, a quad loop but there's another quad loop which is in the plane of that pole uh, so it, it's an outline of an octahedral shape the only snag with this was when we made it it needed some 100 ohm coax for the phasing which we didn't have so i had to make some uh, I made some twin feeder up out of some PVC wire and some spacers to make a, a quarter wavelength of a hundred um, quarter wavelength of a hundred ohm feeder to, to do the phase shift and it was then fed with um, 50 ohm coax now Bob made one of those for six meters he made another one for four meters which has since fallen apart but he's replaced it with this antenna now I really like this antenna it's quite a clever design it uses two unequal loops with a two to one aspect ratio so it's it's rather than a square loop it's a, an oblong or rectangular loop 
and because of the size when it's fed in the middle of the short side it has a 100 ohms impedance so you connect the two together and you've got 50 ohm impedance which matches nicely nicely to the sort of coax we like to use in amateur radio the phasing is achieved by having the loops different lengths so if you look carefully at the construction this cross arm at the top is above that cross arm and down here this cross arm is below that cross arm so this loop is slightly longer than that loop and with the dimensions of timber I used it worked out spot on that the um, all this framework is made of wood by the way it worked out spot on um, with these <coughs> these loops now <coughs> you might think this is vertically polarized but it isn't it's horizontally polarized because these rectangles work like skeleton slots and skeleton slots radiate the opposite way to what you might think so if it's a vertical slot it gives horizontal polarization so <clears throat> that's how that one works and i made one uh, for six meters using the dimensions given by k4ero in his um, qst article and the SWR came out at one to one, spot on, and it, it did work very well. It's got less gain than my turn silent, and where I tested it, it it didn't work as well as my double turn style, but it did work very well. Part of the reason it didn't work as well was a, a it's got a bit less gain. B, where I mounted it temporarily was um, a fair bit lower than the than my normal. Um, six meter double turn style. Uh, so I've pretty well explained all of that. But um, I think that's I think that's a really clever design. I, I like it a lot, and it's cheap to make. It's incredibly cheap to make. Um, if you spend the fiber on it, that's as much as you should spend, and that's including buying wood cost me nothing to make mine because I'd already got the wire and, and I've got some scrap timber that uh, somebody had given, given to me for firewood actually and it proved to be ideal. Um, I'm going to try and rebuild it with hinges in it so that I can fold it flat and take it out portable. I haven't quite got round to that. So, the dis advantages and disadvantages, as I already explained before, you don't need a rotator this is true for all on this uh, and the rotators are currently about five times the cost of the antenna um, this is based on if you make a double turn style out of um, aluminium tube and you need a 40 millimeter support tube you need um, say 10 millimeter diameter tube for the the elements you need some coax and uh, you also need some um, dipole centers some cross dipole centers now these are as rare as hen's teeth these days and for the six meter and ten meter versions i came across some plastic um, u clamps and used those to um, support the elements um since then people have told me that you could print 3d print some suitable dipole centers and which uh, should should make it doable all right uh As you go up in frequency, the gain that you've got with these dual turnstiles becomes uh, compromised, shall I say, because it's probably easier to get gain using a beam antenna or even mount four beam antennas 
pointing north, south, east and west with some overlap, which will give you a, not quite a nominee, but it will have no slight nulls in it. Um, as I said before, they can pick up QRN and QRM from every direction. So it's not all pluses. Um, I came up with the quad turnstile, not to be confused with the turnstile quad that Chevik came up with. It's basically two double turnstiles stacked one above the other. I've only ever built one of these with 70 sems and it's got 11 dBi plus a bit of gain. Uh, I've just recently rebuilt this and improved the phasing harness of it and got a much better match by um, I, I turned out I needed a quarter wave transformer with 21.6 ohms, I think it worked out at, uh, which is a bit awkward. But I thought, well, 25 ohms is near enough, so I paralleled up two pieces of uh, 50 ohm coax to give me a 25 ohm quarter wave transformer. So that's what's in use at the moment. So, like a lot of things, as you go up in frequency, you get to the laws of diminishing returns and the phasing harnesses get complicated. So for the higher bands I developed the Omni fly swatter which looks like this in section. At the bottom you've got a parabolic dish antenna aka satellite dish. Uh, you have a circularly polarized feed um, for the one I built, I just used a splash plate as a reflector and a pair of cross dipoles with a phasing harness made out of some 75 ohm uh, twin feeder. Only a short piece bent like a hairpin. But that seemed to do the job. And then <clears throat> I dangled above it a wire mesh cone with the included angle of 90 degrees. So that gives you in the horizontal planes cross here, this part of the cone is at 45 degrees. So any RF going straight up like that goes out horizontally, but it goes out horizontally in all directions. Um, <clears throat> now this, I only ever built this antenna for 23 sems, and I'm in the process of rebuilding it at the moment. Um, it worked very well when we tried it out and, I, and I, I only used it once on VHF NFD because the support structure for this cone proved to be a bit unwieldy and I've since redesigned it and I'm going to try and mount the cone actually on the dish to make it more transportable. Anyway, um, at the time I could tilt this antenna and point it at the station I was working so I could compare the two signal strengths pointing at, directly at them and uh, straight up against the price water and nobody noticed the difference. I couldn't really measure it, I was only using an S meter on the rig and by ear you wouldn't have noticed the difference and if you looked at the S meter maybe so it's it'll work on any shf frequency any any frequency that you can use for a dish you can use this it's somewhat controversial as to how much gain it's got i claim it's got about 3 db less gain than the uh, than the direct beam from the dish and my dish produced actually 23 dB of gain theoretically. So I reckon it got at least 20 dB of gain when used as a fly swatter. Um, it's spread around 360 degrees but the vertical beam remains the same as the dish would have had if it's aimed horizontally. Which in my case I think was about 4 degrees. It's quite small. Um, can't remember the figures now. It's, <coughs> it's um, nearly 20 years ago since I first made this. Um, but I maintain because it's circularly polarised, the beam rotates itself at the speed of the frequency in use. So it's a bit like a lighthouse spinning round and round and round, but uh, in this case, uh, 
1,296 million times a second. Um, so because it's going so fast, it, it appears to be radiating in all directions at once. Um, it, it isn't really, it's, it's, um, it's being swept. So that's that. Um, I don't know anyone else that's actually built one. I'd love someone to build one and prove me wrong, to be honest with you. But at the moment, I'm still arguing with my, the microwave boys as, as to exactly how it works and how effective it is. Um, I keep threatening to build a nice small portable one for 10 gigahertz, but um, not got around to it. Right, lastly, the Omni V antenna. I'll just mention this because they seem to be favourites of broadcast TV transmitters which is where Paul G4IEV got the idea from. He built one for our contest station many years ago. Um, they were a pain to put up because they were built on triangular lattice mats. They were awkward to transport. Uh, they came in several sections and we only ever had all the sections up at once, but they worked very well. The phasing har harness and power splitter was a bit of a nightmare though. Um, and he spent a lot of time building it, but it was a very effective antenna. He built it for 432 megahertz, and it, it, it had got much more gain than, um, than my uh, quad turnstile. So, as I say, I've never built one of these, so I haven't got much idea of uh, what's involved in actually making it. I've only ever used one on the air. And it was very effective. So that's on the antennas. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. Um, I've uh, just out of interest, I, I just looked at the people attending this session, and we've got 12 DXCC entities uh, represented from all three. IARU regions. So I don't know if that's a first, but but well done on attracting the, such a, a broad uh, audience. We've got one question for you, which has popped up um, from Kim M0KNV, who says, did I hear you correctly that double turnstile antennas should be mounted just above the ground rather than elevated as you'd expect for a normal Yagi? Uh, well, when I say just above the ground, I'm, I'm talking about um, one to two wavelengths. Um, probably the optimum height is one and a half wavelengths. If you get them much higher, the lobes split up. And uh, although the, um, the bottom lobe does increase slightly, you get um, lots of uh, other lobes. It, it looks like a lot of fingers pointing out to the sky. So it, it, they're better closer to the ground than they are too high? Yeah, it, it uses a ground image to increase its gain. Uh, whereas with um, beam Yagis at VHF, UHF, you tend to want to get them at a height where they're operating like a free space antenna. Cool. Uh, and it's more of a comment than a, a question from Andy uh, g 0 poy who says that uh, the turnstiles with passive reflectors are quite common on the weather satellite applications. Uh, and I know you've done some work on passive reflectors, John. Want to say a little bit about that? Um, yeah, as I, as I did mention, the, the other lobes are quite useful for, um, uh, for satellite working. Um, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what he means by um, a passive re reflector. But um, is he talking about a ground station or actually antennas on satellites? Well, we could bring him in and uh, and he can explain himself. Um, I think I've got time to do that. Let's uh, see if I can uh, weave some magic. I hope you're there, Andy. To uh... no, I can't get him to find him. Do, do, do. For some reason, ah, there we go, Andy. Hello. Okay, Andy, go ahead with your question. Explain your your thing about the, uh, the passive reflectors. Okay, on a 
budget sat turnstile, you'll have a crossfire pole at the top, followed un directly underneath it with another set of, of uh, what looks like a crossfire pole, but they're not, they're just reflectors. And they're usually spaced about three quarters of a wavelength rather than a quarter wave. And that pulls the radiation pattern uh, down somewhat. And uh, it probably will eliminate the need for, for the ground effect on a, the antennas that's uh, been talked about now. Ah, unfortunately, I couldn't hear Andy very well um, there, but it's, it sounds to me as though they're, they're working more like radials than, um, than was, anything else. It seems to me like it's sort of like an artificial earth. If it's about three quarters of wavelength down, it's, uh, as you say, it's, it's going to do the job that the, um, the ground would do in, uh, in giving you that, uh, that reflection. So, uh, so, yeah, interesting stuff. We've got a couple of more minutes. As, uh, if anybody's got any more questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, there's nothing coming in at the moment. Um, but I, I, for me, that was a, a, a fascinating trot through uh, how you can get your signal to square in all directions, but, uh, but not be uh, without gain, uh, which I think everybody seems to assume that if you've got a, an omnidirectional antenna, it doesn't have gain. But uh, you've shown that there are ways and means of of correcting that, and uh, in some cases with uh, with better gain than uh, uh, than you would with a with a beam, perhaps. Um, but yeah, in a noisy environment, I can see the, <laughs> the downside of uh, of getting noise coming in from all directions. So, okay, we're just short shy of, of the end. As there no more questions, um, I'd just like to thank John for his presentation, and uh, we will uh, close this session and uh, uh, reconvene. Uh, at 12.05 uh, UTC or 1.05 uh, clock time UK uh, for the chat rooms and uh, you should all have had a an updated uh, ID for that room so you can uh, you can go in and, uh, and, and chat with other people or if you prefer go and visit the bathroom or whatever but uh, uh, the next full presentation is at 14 sorry 12.40 UTC with Anthony talking about FT8 and FT4 for the QRP. So with that, say thanks again, John, and uh, we will end the recording. Thank and you very much.